Welcome to this episode titled The Crossroads of Music and Social Justice, Curriculum of the Mind. From an early age, I've been influenced by music, and it's been an ever-present element in my life. I've always been drawn to bands and artists who convey a lyrical message that intersects with social justice. In my formidable years, I became a fan of artists such as Tracy Chapman, who sung about racial violence and poverty, Midnight Oil and their imposably tall singer Peter Garrett, who tackled issues of nuclear arms buildup, environmental ruin, and corporate greed. And my ultimate favorite band, U2, who addressed the violence in Northern Ireland, AIDS, supported Amnesty International, and a host of other causes. All made an impact on me and pushed my thoughts and rock and roll sensibilities towards action. Whether I was protesting against apartheid, speaking out about racial injustice, or educating individuals with disabilities, I've always felt that I have a musical soundtrack that was the reflection of my involvement. One particular genre of music that made a huge impression on me at an early age was rap and hip-hop. Through rap lyrics, I was exposed to a world that was much different than my own. I felt and understood the struggle, and it was real. Was I drawn to the ever-present throbbing mixed beat, the style and clothes worn by the artist, or the rebellious and often poignant lyrics? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. At the core of rap, or at least the rap I was listening to, was shouting against the racial injustices of the world at the time. Public Enemies, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back album was at the forefront of my musical influences. Chuck D, Flava Flav, and Terminator X were godlike to me at the time, espousing their brand of in-your-face, tell-it-like-it-is rap. Every album they put out fueled my hatred for racial injustice and shaped my viewpoints. To a higher degree, the artist KRS-One was another rapper who attacked heady issues such as systematic oppression. He challenged perceptions of black sensibilities and offered thought-provoking concepts. My friend Mitch and I rarely missed a rap concert that came to town back in the day. Attendance seemed like we were joining more than a musical event, a social movement, if you will. Admittedly, I don't listen to much rap music today, but I wonder if the lyrics reflect a sense of social justice. Do the artists rise up and address the wrongs of the world? Do they hold the belief that knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone? To bring me up to speed of the modern era of rap and hip-hop and its intersection with social justice, I've invited Dr. Stevie Johnson, also known as Dr. View, to the show. Dr. Johnson wrote his doctoral dissertation on black experiences at historically white colleges. Dr. View has in turn invited some artists who are part of a hip-hop collective known as the Space Program and which he is part of, to take part in the discussion today. Today's episode does contain some colorful language, but don't be alarmed. It's utilized to emphasize a point. You'll understand as the episode unfolds. Gentlemen, welcome to the Human Together podcast. Uh, Let's first orientate the conversation by going around the room and introduce yourselves and your particular artistic background. Uh, My name is Jacoby Ryan, part of the space program from Lawton, Oklahoma. And I contributed to the space program as both an artist, a hip hop artist, or artistic, yeah, that's it. My name is Amari Ford. I'm from Oklahoma City, and I'm a musician and composer. And what instrument do you play? You were telling us before the conversation. You, hmm. You're like a man of all, jack of all trades here. I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I went to school on a violin and oboe scholarship. I play keyboard instruments, piano, hand and organ, pipe organ, and I'm a composer. Dr. Steve Johnson, aka Dr. View, uh, from Longview, Texas. DJ, producer, uh, educator, space program. Carl Patterson, a.k.a. Think Progress, a spoken word artist. Did five poems on the album. Jersey City, New Jersey, originally. This is not the entirety of the space program, but it's a large chunk. You guys are all part of the space program. Can you tell me more about that and the album curriculum of the mind? Anyone can jump in about how they contributed to that individually. So the space program actually developed as a dissertation idea originally. So it was more so this context of us as black men coming together and talking about our experiences in college. And this actually started out in 2017. The name actually came about, but I think progress jump in, but uh, 2017, the name came about from some conversation or some thoughts that he was having while he was in the gym. And the, the title Space Program, we were, we were together doing the original mixtape we did. I didn't know most of the people in the, in the group at the time, but we were trying to come up with a name, which I started thinking like it's going to be hard because we're all different. We don't know each other. So how are we going to come, come by the name that we, we all going to agree upon? 
And I was walking to the gym on a nice day and like I was listening to a Tribe Called Quest, the song, The Space Program. And they were saying that there's not a space for niggas, which started to remind me of like the, his questioning that he gave us in the group setting about trying to figure out how do we fit into the curriculum, like the academic setting. And so that piqued my interest. And the more I thought about it, I started researching the space program, the original history of it and NASA and all that. And it's just a coincidence that there were nine I think there was originally nine NASA members for the space program. And then I think there was going to be nine actual artists on the first mixtape we we're going to do. So it was kind of like Kidsmit. And so I was like, I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there. So I sent the group text. And uh, surprisingly, everyone loved it. And so it kind of took off. Now it's kind of its own thing. I think it means a lot more than what it meant when, mm-hmm. I, when I thought the, of the idea. There's a lot of parallels. What, what do you, how did you contribute to the, the project? Um, so I was a hip hop artist. Uh, I was on the first mixtape as well, the first iteration uh, EP, whatever we like to call that one. And really, I mean, I just contributed wherever I could, mainly just as a as a as a songwriter and just trying to bring my perspective. You know, Stevie came to us with the idea, and it was something where we we knew it would be a challenge because it was something different that we nobody had really done before. But at the same time, it was so important and, and it was so so dope. You know, it was like, all right, let's let's jump head first, see what we can do. Yeah, that was my that was my contribution, which is as, as an artist, really providing perspective that I can, as well as my, many of the other artists. And that, I think that's why it was such a dope project because it was just be who you are. And for some people, it was like an opportunity to finally be who you are. Had you been doing stuff individually in the oh, same vein? Yes, sir. Uh, so I've been I've been making music myself since I was 16 years old. I've been doing it for over 15 years now, and it hadn't been nearly this serious this whole time. I'm probably as serious as I've been since 2013. This is the first project of this kind that I've ever been a part of. I think what's great about it, he nailed it. Like, we just brought ourselves to it. Yeah. So when you ask, like, what do we contribute? Ourselves. <laughs> um, because his what he was asking for was black males that went to a PWI and your experiences. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you were a black male that went to a PWI, the rest of it was just bringing yourself and your experiences and what whatever you had. I think what shocked me from a personal standpoint when he asked me to actually perform an album, because I don't think I'm maybe the only artists who don't do it on a regular basis. Like writing po- poetry or doing spoken word is something I did during past time when I was when I had time to do it. Yeah. And I performed a few times, but not nothing I do on a regular basis. So I was surprised. But he opened the space for me to just kind of bring my what I had to the, to the table. But it, it allowed me to dig deeper than I thought I would have normally when I was writing. So it was a great experience. Sounds like you guys emerged in a different way as artists. You know, mm-hmm. you, you each had kind of your own thing going. But when this project mm-hmm. came together, it, it was something totally different. And you really emerged. And mm-hmm. were you able to bring out like a stronger voice for black males in predominantly white universities? I mean, I think so. I think the biggest thing is, well, or the concern that I had was like, when you have 25 black men, there's this there's egos and you, and you wonder like, is it going to be cohesive? Are people going to be able to interact with one another? For the most part, like we didn't have those issues. I mean, it was more so like we're coming together for this common purpose to talk about our experiences. And there's just so much negative energy about, you know, black men in education not being as successful as other individuals. I didn't want to necessarily have a project where that is like, okay, how do we solve the problem? It's more so like, how can I get to understand your experiences and your stories? And how can I create a platform through music that allows you to be creative and where it's an uncensored space that no one's going to tell you, oh, you can't say this, you can't say that. Mm -hmm. So even just from not just an artistic standpoint, but just as, as a man, as a black male who is trying to just survive in this in this world. I mean, it just provided this this space where we can be ourselves, we can learn from one another, we can learn what to say, what not to say, and just be as authentic and grow as grow as much as we can through this process to become better citizens, not just as artists. Yeah. I, I think, think with that the representation of it, it gave a like strength in the voice, I would say. Because I mean, as a story, like a friend of mine had a had a daughter where I was I was chilling with them. We went out to the store and we went to, um, I think it was Sam's. And we went to look at the, um, the dolls and none of the dolls looked like her. And she was like, my dad, why don't any of these look like me? You know, where they were, they all just, she couldn't see herself in any of them. So she couldn't, so she didn't think they were for her um, just as, as a child. I think with that, when we, when we do this project where we were giving representation to the black male who was in a predominantly white institution, when I was there myself in 2012, 2008 to 2013, I didn't have anybody but J. Cole who, who was that for me, you know, and when I met, when I when I discovered J. Cole 
he's probably one of the main reasons why I did graduate, you know, why I didn't quit, why I didn't give up, because I, I heard somebody who'd been there before, who went through it, who got through it, and who did it in a way where it was authentic for themselves and they figured things out, you know. Uh, so I feel like I feel like after looking at, at that in retrospect, that was a lot of what we did. We're now able to be a voice that's been there before that people can look at and say, okay, this is a blueprint of somebody who's been there before, who's been through the same things I've been through, and they've come out on the other side and that this is what they have to say. So this, it's valuable for me to kind of grow from that. Uh, so I think representation was big and strengthening the voice for sure. Yeah. He, he made mention about being authentic, and that was important because when I came into this, I kind of felt like I was my authentic self. But you realize, like, I started to hold myself back when, when it came to write for the project because I was like, oh, I shouldn't say this or is this going to be too vulgar or too controversial? Or, And I remember, I think I had a conversation with Stevie about just, just write, just whatever you want to say. And it was hard for me to do that because I didn't want to offend anyone. <laughs> and I remember on the mixtape that we did, I have a line and Donald Trump has just got elected and I had a line going pretty much against him. And I was hesitant to write it because I'm like, well, this is for his dissertation. I don't want people to look at it the wrong way. But after I, I wrote it, I felt liberated. And especially after I went to the studio, which was my first time in the studio, I felt liberated to say it. And then coming into like this album, I didn't hold back on anything. I, I said whatever I wanted to say. So like, even though I thought I was being my authentic self, I was still being like careful walking around in the spaces I was in. But I think this project has taught me I don't have to be careful. Like I just have to be me. As long as I, I'm authentically me, I can explain my, whatever I say. That's one thing about my, my work on the project. I can explain anything I said on it in an in intelligent way and tell you, like, this is what I mean by it. So if you're offended by it, then that's something you need to look at and not something I need to look at. So I think the project has helped me realize, like, I have a voice and there's things I want to say and don't hold back anything I want to say. So it was important. Did, do you think that strengthened the dissertation when you had honest, authentic voices that weren't holding back? I mean, I think it even helped me when I defended it. So, <laughs> I mean, I was... I was appreciative that they were so confident and authentic with their voice that if there was a question about what was said, they gave me the motivation to to defend what they wrote. So yeah, it definitely strengthened you know my process, my writing process, or even just how I conveyed the message of what we were trying to to say within this album, and how it's because a lot of people will say, "What does a rap album dissertation have to do with education?" And for me to justify lyrics, certain elements of the roles of educators, faculty, staff, administrators that they have in why black men are having these type of experiences and the ways that they either use or they abuse their power or that they're not listening to what they have to say. It just made my justification that more stronger and it allows people to see things from a different element. So especially with education and funding not being where it needs to be in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a different way or a different lens for us to have conversations about policy, about educational programs that we need to be having, about the, the history that's been erased in Oklahoma and how it needs to be taught in schools. And so all these different things are spark my ideas of like, what are the things need to be implemented in education based upon what they wrote or what they conveyed in the so it, Where do you go from here as far as what you've done with the curriculum? Are you going to bring that into the educational wor world and especially the, some of the recordings? Where do you guys go from here as far as educating people, essentially? Real quick about the last question you asked, about yeah. the, if it strengthened the presentation as far as authenticity. Uh, I think this is an example of that is, I mean, every show we, we perform at. So like we went to New York City and performed at the AERA conference. It's the and, American Educational Research Association. So it was like. Any educators that you know of are at this conference. It's like enormous. Hmm. And so from Coachella, it's, yeah, it's like the Coachella of education or like the Grammy education. And you guys performed it? No, uh, we, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So. And, and when we were performing, so I, I asked you before we performed, like right, right before the show, I said, hey, do you think we should cuss? Yeah, is, it, should, is it okay if we cuss? Like, yeah. should we censor ourselves? Yeah. Um, and he was like, no, nah, like, be yourself, like, do it. Like, and I said, let's get it. Let's do it. <laughs> what were people's, I mean, were you dropping the N-word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything. What were people's reaction to that? Every show we performed at, somebody's cried. Hmm. And they said that this is so raw, authentic, and it's saying everything that needs to be said. And it's not holding anything back. And like, so it showed me how powerful authenticity is in the connection of human beings. You know what I'm saying? So, and going back to your question about, educational piece, we uh, on top of New York, I mean, we went to Texas State University a couple months back. 
I didn't. So they what they did was they took our album, our visuals, and they had conversations. And at the end of the event, students were able to conduct rhymes based upon like beats that were on the project. Mm -hmm. um, and so to your question about curriculum instruction, it just shows us like the power of what we're doing. It's not just an album. Like we want to create curriculum. We want to go into the schools that need it the most, the east side of Oklahoma City, the south side, Walton, Oklahoma, North Tulsa. And so the ability to not only perform, but to have conversations with educators, with parents, with students, and for, especially like at a young age, to see that we are black men in education and we understand the struggles and we, these are the, the pitfalls or these are the mistakes that we've made. And we hope that based upon what we've, you know, experience, we don't want you to go through the same things. And then for us to find creative ways to, again, build curriculum or have conversations is something that we're working on. The feedback you got from your performance has validated all the hard work you put in. You guys put in as artists, like, this is making a difference. This is impactful. To me, if I was in your position, I'd be like, I'm going to keep on doing this. This I, is awesome. I think this the, is man, I'm sorry. But yeah. I think the, the issue is that a lot of people aren't willing to listen. So a lot of times... People have a negative connotation of hip hop and they don't see the connection with education. So automatically it's like, what are you here for? Or like, I just recently cut my hair and I did it because it was hot. It's not because <laughs> I'm getting this new job, but, but it was more so like, I wanted to be myself in every capacity. So my dissertation, I don't, I don't necessarily dress the par that people would perceive. It's just <laughs> like, this is who I am. And either you take me for who I am or you just yeah. got to keep it pushing. So. I like I think that's the message that we're trying to convey. Like you can always be yourself, mm -hmm. and you can. But like we, we read, we conceptualize, we we understand what's happening in society, mm -hmm. and we we put our own twist to it. And that's the only thing that we can ask for for young people is that hey, like you can do the same thing. We're making this accessible for you. Now you take what we have and reimagine what the next step will look like in yeah. the future. So. I think it's just some, it's important to say what others can't say. Or others don't know how to say. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the album did. There's some people that are afraid to say what we said. And there's some are who just don't know how to say it. And we did it. So we connected with them in that way. And I think he was just talking about like all of us, we're, we're learning how to be authentically ourselves and our identity. And I think that what I love about it is there's a difference between like schooling and then education. I think we've learned through this process that we're, we want to be educated, not school, because the schooling process is not where it should be. So it's important for us to be educated. And that doesn't mean you have to go through the college route. It just means you need to get on your grind and get that education, however you do it. And I think that's what's important. I think throughout the album, even though at the end of it, he decides to stay in college, the important message is go get it how you need to get it. You know, because there's going to be pitfalls and things up against you. So just go get it. And so I think we're about more learning and the education aspect of it. But education is connected to college, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be the only route. So I think we're learning how to be ourselves and go get it. And I think we're hopefully inspiring others to do that with the work we put out. Sounds like the album in itself is a form of education as well. Yeah, yeah, something I'm, You're not going to get this type of information and things that you guys are saying in the classroom. So I think it's a much needed it's a history lesson. Mm -hmm. And like on top of that, and I just kind of took out this idea after Carl said what he just said to answer your question about how we can maybe educate with this going forward, how we can move forward with this. I think like the next iteration of education as we're seeing now is like, I think self-education is going to be going to incre keep increasing and be like, the main form of learning over the next 20, 30 years, uh, just with the internet, the online, so much being accessible when people are not wanting to be in front of people and not want to have that pressure and just want to be able to say, okay, I can watch this video as many times as I want to and learn myself and then I can go educate Google myself and learn these things. So I think I'm a big fan of Gary Vee and he says the same thing where he, he feels like self-education is going to be the main way people absorb information and start growing in the future. And I think with that, we have an opportunity now to where we can use our art to help people self-educate where they can be entertained, watch our video 50 times. And it's, it's helping them think about things where they, okay, it's leading them to the next thing to go research or go look at or think about considering themselves and ask why in themselves. And even more so than music, like we can, we can put out content where it's just, they can watch it online at, at home at two in the morning when they get home from the club mm -hmm. and just be like, man, like it's been on my mind. I don't know how to, how to take this. I don't know what to think about this watch it on repeat, wake up in the morning, watch another video, 
listened to an audio book, talks about an idea that sprouted from watching something or listening to something. And I just think self-education is going to be a big, a big form of, of absorbing information in the future, especially just with the fact that schooling hasn't really been updated since, I mean, the manufacturing lines and the, the factories. Um, so with the assembly line way of schooling that hasn't really been updated with technology, but like it's either something has to evolve or self-education is going to be a big, big thing in the future. I think it's going to be hard to quantify the impact that you guys make, but it's certainly going to be out there. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, I um, <laughs> purposely put things in my, my poems that would make people go look it up if they didn't know it. And I didn't explain a lot of it. For you example? Know, for like redlining. I talked mm -hmm. about redlining. I talked about the souls of black folk. I talked about John Lewis, Walk the Bridge in Selma. Like, you need to know why did he walk the bridge in Selma? Like, I didn't go into detail of it, but there's a purpose for why that's important in that particular poem that I wrote. We even um, got Willie G. Willie G, who's, who's in the space program, yeah. who, who heard something on the album. He heard something about the oh, Tulsa yeah. Black Wall Street yeah. Massacre. And he was like, what is that? And he went back. He didn't He didn't ask us. He just went back and researched, yeah. came back, and he said, man, I didn't know about this. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. And then put it in a song. And then put it in a yeah. song. Yeah. And that was important for me. I know, just speaking from my perspective, that I wanted to teach as well. I wanted to show my experience. So in every one of my poems, I'm giving my experience. But every one of my poems, I'm also giving a history lesson on things that, as people of color and Black people, we should know. Mm -hmm. And if we don't know, we need to know. Yeah. But what, I, what I'm impressed about the most is that it stayed into the concept of what we were doing, which was really challenging, but it was important to me. So I took extra time to make sure like it, it all flowed together. But at the same time, someone can get something from it. Like it had value. Like after you you got into the group up, you listened to it, you liked it. You can step away and research the stuff and actually get more value from what was done. So you're getting more value than just the listening experience. Kind of the tip of the iceberg. You show them just a little bit, and then mm -hmm. once you you research, you do a little bit more. And then you go back and listen to it. And it makes all it makes yeah. sense. Or yeah. even like the sound. So like like songs that we sample. Mm -hmm. so I want to do the, the He's sitting quiet over there. I don't think he was. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should have brought him an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> what specific social issues does the Sprays program address? We've kind of looked at the surface. What are some specific social issues? You talked about black male experience in white predominantly schools being as one. What are some other? One, so something I can think of, uh, one is financial literacy and how, well, I mean, it can go all the way from Slave or slave owners being paid reparations and us not being paid reparations, or sorry, I'm sorry, slave being paid or slave owners being paid but not slaves. And then you look at the the, the banks when you look at the, the bank issue. Um, so like the, the whole financial literacy part summed up in the school loans. You know what I'm saying where we're we're told to go take out school loans for college. You need to go to college to be successful. You need to take out school loans for that. It's almost like predatory lending. Then I think my my biggest one, in my opinion, the most valuable one was how the removal of our history impacted our identity and how that that impact on our identity impacts our future. You know what I'm saying? Whereas like I was a child, I didn't learn about the Black Wall Street massacre until I was 24 years old. Mm -hmm. I lived two hours down the street from it. And so, and I learned it like up until I was 24 years old, everything in American history, and I'm sorry, everything in Black history and American curriculum is basically slavery, Jim Crow, mass incarceration, and now. Yeah, yeah. Like that's that's black history as far as what America taught me. So like my entire identity was rooted in some form or fashion in slavery my entire life until I was 24 years old. So now look, I connect that to how I acted as a child. And a lot of the times I didn't act like I value myself. I didn't have value in myself and didn't think I was worth much. And I, and I thought like, I mean, you have my contemporaries and I'm, my mom is white, you know, so like I, I have this other side as well. And you have my, my friends, homies who, who are white, who are these different races, who do have people who look like them, who did great things, who were never attached to slavery, like Napoleon the Great, um, Alexander the Great, these people who just did these, these amazing things, supposedly like Christopher Columbus, like even things that were fabricated in order to give value to a group of people mm -hmm. and seeing how they had that, but I didn't have that. And I didn't register that at the time, you know? And all, all I knew was subconsciously, I, I, all I was was ever was a slave, you know? Mm -hmm. So just thinking that, I think that impacts our identity and the way that we view ourselves and in essence, how we are to other people in, in a lot of ways. So I think that was one of the biggest things I feel like the album talked about. I think just beyond African-Americans learning those, you know, I know the history of the Tulsa Rates riots. I know the histories of the great migration and things like that. And just as a Caucasian person, that opened my mind up. It's like, okay, these people went through that. What did Asian people go through? What did you know, other ethnic? So that was kind of centered me back on humanity. We talked about freedom was a big thing also. 
in my first poem on the album, the second one, mm-hmm. I went into really the question in my mind was, are we really free? You know, like I compare. Yeah, will we ever be free? Yeah, will we ever be free? So I compared like today what you see a lot on the news, which is police brutality. But then I wanted to go back and say, all right, so what's the difference? We were slaves and we're getting whipped and things like that is what I was talking about on the, on the poem. But then I bring it up to like, we're still getting, you know, done, done wrong in a way. We're police, police brutality. And I made a transition. I compared the two because I wanted the listener to say, okay, this is horrible. He's talking about slavery and all this stuff. Then I transitioned right into current times of police brutality because I wanted you to think, are we really free? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and one line I says, um, I don't want to talk about, I, I said I wasn't going to write about freedom anymore. Because I don't want to write about it because we've been talking about it for so long, but yet we still haven't got there. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important to recognize, like, because I think some people, when you talk about it, they're like, oh, that's happened in, you know, 1600s. And like, oh, no, slavery is not. You guys are still worried about something. You weren't even born when that was happening. Yet they just they're ignoring the version of enslavement that we have today. Yeah. They're ignoring like this. I actually have trauma when it comes to police officers. I've never been to jail. I never got a ticket. I have no, no record at all. But when I see a police car ride by, like, I, I get startled. Mm-hmm. There's a trauma there. I've been thrown on the ground and accused of doing something I didn't do by police on multiple occasions to where, like, it still feels like I'm enslaved now. I have to walk around being aware of my surroundings, but not because of dangerous areas, but because of the police are around. I have to worry about, am I about to get stopped for being out somewhere? So I wanted to compare the two because I wanted people to know it's still a relevant issue. And we're not talking about it because we're trying to, like, hatch hash up old issues. Yeah. It's still current. It's not slavery, but it's still something that's mm. relevant. About that, I think what's big is like, we talked about this, how like, we, we, we look at America and we say progress has been made and things have changed and things have gotten to the point. And I always ask the question, like, what indicates a psychological change in America since slavery? Like, mm-hmm. what what's an indicator that says, okay, the psychology of America thinking that they're supreme, superior over another race, what it, where has that changed? And I don't think there's ever a point in history that we can look at and say the actual psychology of the collective America mm-hmm. has changed. So we, we look at when slavery was undone, slave owners were paid reparations and slaves weren't. And then of course they were promised these things in the uh, in the constitution that, that they were supposed to have 40 acres and a mule. And then they weren't given that, they were given banks in replacement of that. And then even the banks that they were given were literally safe havens for white bankers to invest money that they wanted to risk and then when they lost the money, the black people who were invested in the banks were out. And that's why now black people now don't trust banks, you know, and then these are black owned banks. So it's, these are it's, it's a synthesis of all these things. And I think it can be described and simply that the American psychology of slavery or supremacy has never changed. It sounds like you're heading towards some like institutional racism. Absolutely. as a. Well, I wanted to talk about you're asking about the social issues that we address. And I think that one of the things that we did address is. In not sort of a direct way, but it's narrative. And so being able to tell our own stories and tell like the full story. Even like earlier, you mentioned the Tulsa race riots. Well, when we look at what happened, it wasn't riots. It was a massacre. A bunch of people died. Mm -hmm. And so like taking back the narrative and telling the story Mm -hmm. and telling like the correct part of the story, Mm -hmm. I think is something that that we did a really good job of. And even talking about like the Tulsa race massacre, like even now that I'm moving to Tulsa, I mean, there's been not necessarily like disputes between me and my wife, but more so like very clear discussion about where we want to live. Because, of course, there's great housing additions on the outskirts of Tulsa. Mm-hmm. But when we talk about peace of mind and community, there's only one option for me, and it's Gilcrease Hill slash Tulsa. And so all of this, this album is reflected in just like day to day life conversations too like yeah it's great that south tulsa has everything that we need yeah. as far as like because i mean north tulsa is a few a food desert there's not enough resources out there but when i talk about peace of mind or like my son being able to be on his bike in his neighborhood knowing that if a, a police car comes by that he won't be racially profiled mm-hmm. that supersedes anything than living in this type of neighborhood. So I just wanted to bring that into context. Like this this album reflects not just the black male experience, but also like the trauma that we experience, not just on, on the everyday, but the generational trauma and the historical context mm-hmm. of, of racism and how it's embedded in our, in our culture. I think there was a belief that 
oh, Obama's president, racism is over. <laughs> you guys, have, have you heard that before? Oh, is that, <laughs> so, oh, race, okay. All of a sudden, we have an African-American president, racism is over. Right. My, I mean, that's not true. But. The, the, only, the only value that I saw out of Obama's presidency was that black kids can see themselves in that seat now. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of that, I didn't see much. It had to be a first, though. Exactly. To make that happen. So I think the next would be make more progress. But much wasn't going to come from it because the deck was stacked against them. Yeah. It's like you won. Like but, but, so it, but it also things. feels as if like, okay, you had your turn. Like, it's, it's, it's not going to happen ever again. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I get the feeling like, oh, well, we, we appease you all. We elected this black male president. But, like, don't expect it to happen. Did Look, you guys get a sense that people were thinking, there you go. There's yeah. your person. You're oh. good. Racism. I think it was... I think it was authentic progress in the psychology of America. And I think every bit of progress that any minority group has made in America has always been followed by a short period of white black backlash, mm -hmm. uh, where it's like, we're scared of this happening. And like, like after, after um, Jim Crow ended, I'm sorry, after slavery ended and that reconstruction period, the books say like the, the lower class black and white people started to understand there's no difference in us. Like we're, we're the exact same. Like there's no reason for us to be at war with each other. And then the powers that be, the institution, however you want to word that, they saw that and that's when Jim Crow came about where it's like blacks only and whites only to where now it's a caste system to where now the white, the, the poor people who got to, along together who are white and black, now the poor whites get to have the nicest establishments, the nicest things. So now they feel like even though they're on the lowest totem pole of the white people, they're still higher than black people. You know, and I think that that was a, a backlash from the the unity that was shown when after slavery ha happened and people started seeing, okay, there's no difference here. We're the same. And I think after Jim Crow was the same thing where people got started to realize like, hey, like when the um, the hippie movement, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's ironic that it followed the civil rights movement after we got the civil rights at the Martin King Jr. fought for that and many people fought for that. And then you see after that, the war on drugs being infested where, where all these drugs are being moved into the places where these ghettos were created by redlining. Hmm. And now it's a it's the same system where now it's like, okay, now we're just gonna take off a lot of y'all and go take, take you to jail. And now people are gonna say on, on the news, you're a drug dealer, people are drug dealing in this and fathers aren't there. So I mean, I think, I think every period of progress in America for any group of minorities has always been followed by a white backlash from the institution. And I think with that, when we talk about the institution of racism, that's the only one I care about. I don't care about like the personal racism. I don't care about people who feel a certain way about me. My only issue is the fact that racism has power over me. You know what I'm saying? As far, not, not, not my destiny, but as far as me in America, there's an institution that I'm up against where it's, it's a conscious effort to put me in a box or discredit me or to keep me away from certain things. And, and I think that's the case for a lot of people. But with that, I don't value fighting anything else because that's just preference, it's personality. Like when people say racism is reverse racism. And I, I say it's not possible. It's possible to be discriminant toward people, but racism is literally a system of superiority over another race. And there's never been a time where black people have been superior over white people that, I can, that I've ever heard about in my life. Uh, so with that institution being that way, that's all that I see. And I talk to my mom about it a lot because she's white, you know, and, I, and my family's big on Trump and, and, and things like that. And I, I doubt that they heard this project we've done. <laughs> um, I doubt that they'll listen to it. <laughs> but I told her that I, I do believe that white supremacy is so ingrained in American psychology that it takes forceful, uncomfortable inner work for everybody, especially white people, to undo that. Mm -hmm. And if, and if and it's and like I said, it's uncomfortable, it's hard to do. But and so I understand when people like are just don't want to do it, you know. But it, I think that has to be done, um, especially on the part of white people to undo that. Because uh, I've seen it so close, I feel like. I took a class, and Dr. Johnson, you may have taken one too, called uh, Diversity and Equity. And they talked about white male dominance in institutionalized. And a lot of people in the class were like, well, you know, I'm not racist. I'm a white guy. I'm not racist. But it was more about the power structures. And it really kind of opened my eyes when you kind of step back and look at it. And you're like, you know, some of the things you're talking about, yeah. a lot of people don't. It's not ingrained in them to think like that. But mm -hmm. there is a lot of institutional things, and it's just... People inherit those things, yeah, yeah. and so and I just learned that the sub the human subconscious has like thousands more horsepower than the conscious. So like, what we dormantly know, what we what what we literally where we operate from is hard for us to detect, but it controls everything that we do know. The marketing that we that we're under, like that's that's America's contribution to art in the world is advertising. The marketing 
just directed to the subconscious to where it's, it's planting seeds in our subconscious. And I think like when you look at as kids on cartoons, when everything evil was dark and everything beautiful was white, just these different things that are innocent, but at the same time rest in our subconscious, they can be innocent, they rest in our subconscious, they really create the conscious and, and these ideas that, that may not be real, may not be accurate, it may not be right, but it feels right because this is what all we've known, you know? And so mm -hmm. I don't fault individual people because there's a literal force against you to make you be like this. So it takes a lot of inner work for it. I just want to acknowledge it. I've had the conversations with my son. We had a couple of weeks ago, we were talking, I send my kids, one of my favorite texts to send to them is Black Santa Claus. And so to him, he said, oh, Dad, why are you sending Black Santa Claus? Mm -hmm. He said, Santa Claus is white. Mm -hmm. so he said, the Coke cats, the movies. I said, why can't Santa Claus be black? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I want my own kids to realize this, that don't get caught. And, and I send that to them, you know, in the middle of July, I send them that. And the message is, don't stereotype anybody. Right. Why does one person have to be this way or one person have to be that way? So yeah. I think, yeah, I think those part things. of... I think part of the, the the works that we talk about with a lot of black people are, are doing the work and we're to be honest we're just tired and mm -hmm. so a lot of times people use the term ally you know with shout out to Bettina Love but she talks about this thing like we need co-conspirators we need we don't need people just going to walk with us through marches or put up signs we need people who are going to like check who when black people aren't around if if there is conversations about superiority complexes or things that are said that are racist or, or homophobic that's the time where we need our co-conspirators to like check these people because a lot of times if we're if we're doing the work it's it's on deaf ears like it's not going to happen but we need those individuals who are going to be able to like check check their own and be there for us because at the end of the day we're not we can't do it by ourselves there were two of you that brought up a term that i'm vaguely familiar with redlining explain that a little bit Redlining was a practice where bankers or mortgage loan officers would draw red lines around neighborhoods. The idea was that banks, so starting with the banks, banks would not give loans, home loans or business loans to minorities. They would mm -hmm. only give it to white people. Mm -hmm. You look in the, and after the Vietnam War, there were GI bills given by the military for people who came back from the war to start, like stimulate the economy, to, to, to build homes, to go buy things to, of course, just to, to get things going. And they weren't given to black people. That, that was a, a strict adherent rule. And so redlining was a form of all this. So redlining was where a mortgage loan officer, where basically you would go into a bank and you ask for a loan to buy a home or to start a business. And they would say, okay, of course I get your information, your address, things like that. And on the, this map, they would have green, yellow, and red areas. So red areas where it said, okay, this is where mostly black people live. It said, no, don't give them loans. They don't get loans for anything. And this is, at one point, banks were allowing loans to go to liquor stores and things that were like detrimental to the community. Check exactly. Cash. Check mm -hmm. cashes, exactly. Mm -hmm. But if somebody wanted to start a business or things that were that were going to boost the economy, it wasn't allowed. Then you have the yellow area was where it said, okay, this is predominantly white, but there are Blacks and Latinos infiltrating this space. So be aware and, and just be cautious of who you give loans to, how you give loans, how many, how much you give. The green level was, this is white, it's a go. Don't even need to hear nothing, just give them the cash out. Exactly. Go cash out. Hmm. And, and a lot of this was offset, of course, by there were banks owned by Black people who they didn't have the financial capability to sustain themselves. So they had to depend on some white banks and these white banks use these black banks as places to hold money and, and invest in risky uh, assets where if they lost the money, it was just gone. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't give anything yeah. back. Uh, they didn't honor it. So all these things kind of added on to, and, and, and this is why the people who had their money in these banks, when they lose their money, and they have loans. Now they can't pay their loan back because the money that they had in the bank was gone. And vicious now cycle and now mm -hmm. they exactly and now they have an, an excuse to say you didn't pay our loan back so we're not going to give you a loan it's just like now where they'll do something like they'll proactively take action that they know that action takes away the capability of a group then they'll say okay so since you can't take care of the capability that you need to have done well, you can't have this action anymore you know and so it's like they build a problem to say okay you don't have a solution for this problem so you can't you can't get access to this anymore. Okay, that clarifies it for me. <laughs> I, I was <laughs> not familiar with that term. And just to kind of to, to develop that, this is this is how ghetto started. So this was mm -hmm. going in. So these were the inner city parts, um, and then now 
So most of these redlining areas were, were neighborhoods that were in the inner cities. This is how ghettos became to be where places where they didn't weren't they weren't able to invest inside of the community because they didn't have the capital. When you look at um, wealth building in America, somewhere between 75 or somewhere around 75 percent of wealth building starts with capital from loans or from banks. So if we don't have access to that. We have no way of doing that. So now these ghettos start. And now, now it's interesting because now you see where they redlined the areas that they redlined back in the day are actually some of the most valuable pieces of real estate. And now they're starting to realize that where in New York City, the places that overlook the, the waters and the, and the places that are these valuable pieces of property are places where ghettos are and, and, and where they move black people. And then of course, when they move black people there, white people said, okay, we don't want to be around them. So we're going to move them to the suburb, how the suburb started. We're and trying now, to push them out. Exactly. And now the, the transition is switching where People, uh, people who have money are starting to go to white people mostly are starting to go towards inner city. And now people who are in the ghettos and the hoods are starting to get pushed out, out of the city because it's not valuable. It's, it's a kind of a reverse value. white flight that you saw exactly. over years and years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, my next question is this, guys. Are, are the issues that you address through your music and your art circumstances that happen to you personally? Are you guys speaking to greater issues? It's a mix for me. Like I said earlier, like I wanted to give a history lesson as well. I didn't want to just come from my own perspective, but also tap deep into my own experiences because I think that will help the research. But also I found value in that going to these places, these things I haven't thought about. Some of them I haven't thought about for years. Some I just kind of like ignored because I didn't want to feel what came with that. So it was valuable to sit down and like write it and not just think about it, but to actually put words to it and then tell these stories to myself, like to relive these stories. Um, the experiences that were pretty harsh to remember, but they were valuable for me to to tell those because mm-hmm. I think we connect. And I think that's why you get tears sometimes when we perform. It's we connect like our stories, like it comes to a point where we realize our stories are not our own, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. they're ours, but at the same time, others share them, maybe in a different city or a different state or maybe a different generation even, but it's a commonality to it. So they found, found solace from, from our experiences. So it's good to vocalize that. And then like being a therapist, you, you realize that too, that being able to connect with people through the shared experience and the things they go through is what they find value and to get them to open up and be vulnerable and to share what they think is a weakness is actually their strength. Because once you share that, like once I did this, these poems and I came out on the other end, I was stronger for it. Mm-hmm. So that I think that was valuable to share these experiences. Man, that's powerful. Mm-hmm. That's, that's great. I think one of the most powerful things is like the shared experiences. So like at the beginning, when we first met, we didn't make music. We talked about our experiences with anti-Blackness. You know, Stevie had us bring in these artifacts. It was like a class. <laughs> so we had to discuss things that we had experienced. And I think one of the things that came out of that is that we've all had similar experiences. So I think that on the project, it might be someone telling like their story. But like Carl said, like, their story is our story. <laughs> and so I think that that's one of the most powerful things is being able to see yourself like displayed on a, on a platform, something that you may not get to see. I can, I can give a tangible experience. So kind of talking about the artifacts and then what Carl said earlier. So one of the tracks is called Polaroids. And so Rich, shout out to Rich. He's one of the photographer, videographers of the group. One of his artifacts was a Polaroid camera and oh, for the picture, Polaroid picture. He talked about this idea of freedom and how he feels free when he's taking pictures, but he's also aware and cognizant that there's always a white border around him. So in this, in the context of like white America, like I'm free when I when I DJ and produce. Jacoby is free when he is writing or in in the studio or performing, but we are also aware of the larger context of society. Mm-hmm. And so for the fact that Rich is not artist that can articulate his thoughts over a song, the ability for Jacoby to, to be that voice or that beacon for him through this process was was like one of those like aha moments for me. It's like, we're taking research, we're taking these experiences, we're discussing it, we're coming together as a group, and now we're taking theory to practice and creating this project. I've never seen anything done like this. It <laughs> seems incredible to me. Yeah. I think you guys are hit on the gold line, honestly. Yeah. So I think one of the big picture things for me personally is like, as being mixed with black and white is using these authentic experiences to create understanding, you know, and not not the, the cliche unity. I think unity is like a byproduct of literally understanding. If you understand somebody, it's like, okay, I'm the same way. And I think when we talk about these experiences and when we see like conferences where people cry, you know what I'm saying, who may not have been thinking that way before, but maybe like it's just like 
they could not run from him anymore because it was attacking them so much. And then they're like, okay, I understand. I get it. And they understand the significance and the urgency of the issue and understanding that they may not even understand and relate directly, but they understand the urgency of why this matters so much. You know, uh, I think it falls on deaf ears a lot. And I think with almost in a, in a nutshell, just how authenticity just breaks down all the bullshit. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Where it's like, you can listen to the propaganda, you can listen to everything that's been skewed to you your whole life. But if you listen to my true, genuine experience and you feel from my experience and you can see my humanity in that, everything else is irrelevant. Even with that, like you look at me, I, I felt when I've, when I've been profiled by police, I felt when I've been oppressed or when I felt like I walked into a room, people looked at me like they didn't want me to be there just because of how I looked, mm-hmm. not even knowing who I am, not even trying to get to Judged know who you I am. before. Exactly. That experience now makes me passionate about helping my my LGBTQ brothers. That experience helps me passionate be passionate about my feminine my uh, feminist uh, sisters. Mm-hmm. It helps me be passionate about my immigrant brothers and sisters. It helps me be passionate about uh, my Muslim brothers and sisters. Where it's like I don't have to know your experience, fit in your shoes to understand the urgency of you being treated like a human and being respected for your dignity. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't need all that. I just need to know fight for that because if if it's a, if yours is threatened. Mine's being threatened too. And I know that firsthand. And I think when we put ourselves in those shoes and, and understand that, that opens our minds to be like, okay, everything else other than us respecting each other and, and, and making sure that we hold each other down is important. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think the black community has received that from anybody. I haven't received it from ourselves. Like we're a black community. A lot of the times we put other interests before our own and that's not really returned, you know? And I think just us being authentic and us like, really understanding like, okay, we need to fight for other people just but we fight for ourselves. Every group, you know what I'm saying? Mostly white the white people need to realize like let's let's fight for, for everybody else because they have a lot of the, the leverage, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, with the way things are being. I think that shared experience is what also we talked about there was no ego in the room. That shared experience created a brotherhood like instantly, which took out the ego. Mm-hmm. Because I think we were in this together. It was something we were trying to get out to the world together. So the ego got eliminated very early because we shared experience. We realized we didn't know each other very well, but through the shared experience, we did start to know and connect, wow. which removed that ego. And I think the the te- like one of the biggest takeaways when we did like the one-on-one interviews is something Amari said, you know, we're doing all this great work and we're, we're talking about these, you know, these concepts or issues of freedom. And he posed a question like, what is freedom if we're free and no one, and no one else is? So talk right. about, you know, our Muslim counterparts and all and everyone else. It's like if if we're not bringing this conversation to the larger context, it's like what are we really doing the work for? And so that that just sat with me like like in, in anything I do as far as just small talk conversations or just listening to people's stories, I try to really, truly understand what people are saying and, and find ways to to be a co conspirator for them as well. It sounds like your audience is not just Black people, mm-hmm. I mean, who, who do you guys perceive your audience to be? Who do you Humanity. think you're educating? Yeah, Humanity. Everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't say people or like humans, just because like, it's a lot, it's just, I don't know why I don't. Why I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Humanity, <laughs> I late, <laughs> Humanity just sounds better. I just think like, we're speaking to the understanding of everybody. Let me ask you this, and it's not a question that I formulated before, but something that's on my mind. You guys talk to the rawness of your lyrics and the cussing and the N-word and all that. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like that in any way detracts? That specifically, do you think anybody says, oh, this guy's calling himself the N-word? I'll call him that too. Someone who listened with bias, yeah. But if you listen with open mind, no. Mm-hmm. Because there's power behind the lyrics. We're not throwing out N-words and MFers and all that because we just like to say those words. Those words have have a reason. Yeah. I think I cursed like three times on it. And like when I said it, I meant it. Yeah. And I meant it for a reason. If you were to ask me about the particular reason why, I would tell you, like I said it because that's what it, the song needed mm-hmm. for that moment. Was um, that a written lyric or was it, did that come out of emotion and collective of all that? One of mine came out of emotion. It also and, depends on the artist. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Some for, for your lyrics. Yeah, I was just like... My one of them came out of emotion. One came out of like the other ones came out because it fit and needed to go there. The other one because it was in the first poem I did on the album track two. Like I got to the end and like I'm if you get to the second half of the poem, I'm rattling off all this stuff and I'm getting like angry as I'm <laughs> rattling off this stuff. And then I say F it at the end, you know, like F this. And like that was just and I wrote it and it just came out and then I was going to remove it. But then it goes back to authenticity. Right. Mm-hmm. That's how I felt when I wrote it. So I'm not taking it out. 
because it, it every time I say it, it to me it needs to come after yeah. what I'm saying. So I think it has purpose. I call it righteous indignation. I mean, mm-hmm. it's if people were were able to be in our shoes, they would see why we use the language that we use. Just like I wear this shirt, I, it's a social experiment. Mm-hmm. I, I think that if people have an issue with it, it's it's a reflection of mm-hmm. their issues and problems. It's not a reflection of us. So, mm-hmm. like you just have to be in our shoes and understand why we're upset, why we're angry, and why. Ask us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Someone, <laughs> if someone makes yeah, an don't album, get angry back. Ask us. If, we'll album, if an album mm-hmm. says I got stomped out by the police for being black. I got, I went to college on predatory loans. I've never been able to pay it back ever in my life. So now I'm in debt for the rest of my life. Nigga fuck shit. <laughs> and all you hear is nigga fuck shit. That's a complete reflection of how you think internally. That's the internal problem. That's the yeah. mental issue. That that's that bias and we don't care for that. <laughs> like if that's, if that's all that you've processed and you've heard yeah. and you paid attention to and given energy to. Yeah. That speaks to a much more deep-seated, rooted problem. I think it creates dialogue. And that's the reason I asked the question. I know your music is much more than that, but Mm -hmm. I I would hate for someone to go, yeah, it's all about it. Well, yeah, they're going to do it because that's how we've been trained to think about hip-hop. So, like, me, as a person who did not grow up listening to hip-hop, I'm probably, like, the only person in the group (laughs) that is not a hip-hop head. And in fact, I was hesitant to participate in the group, and that was one of the main reasons, because I don't do (laughs) hip-hop. But, like, being part of this experience opened my mind to, like, the idea that maybe it's not what I think it is. And I've met met some of the most brilliant people in this collective than I ever have in my life. And so people are going to see it and say, oh, well, yeah, that's just, like, some niggas that made some music and you know they're not talking about anything but if they take the time to do the work and it's 2019 so pretty much everybody has internet access Mm -hmm. google is a free tool that you can use Mm -hmm. so there's so many things that you could find out if you put forth the effort Mm -hmm. to do that i think that's another thing is like we're not like we talk about no ego like we're not Mm -hmm. in this for glory we don't Mm -hmm. need to get notoriety for this and i think we look at like Martin Luther King Jr., you look at Nelson Mandela. I mean, you look at the four congresswomen now, the squad, like the, how, I think they're in the same vein where at the time people misunderstood everything about them. You know saying they did, they made every Colin effort Kaepernick. that they could to misunderstand Colin Kaepernick. They made every, they made every effort to misunderstand them and to discredit what their, what their intention was while they were alive. You can't fight the energy. Like you can't fight that, the force of that energy that that provided humanity. So even if we don't, I said to say like, People are gonna feel that way, but we're not here for them to feel good. We're not here for them to look at us like God. We're mm-hmm. not here for them to to give us attention. We're here to to make change in, in humanity and the consciousness of the world. Whether that comes while we're alive, whether it comes when we're dead, whether that comes from somebody else that's not even us. It's not. It doesn't matter to us. It's just mm-hmm. we just want people to get it. Or or, you know? or like we want to make people uncomfortable because we're uncomfortable all the time. Disruption. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's 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 my thing. Like. If you if you feel uncomfortable or this is not for you, that that's that's a good thing. Person, that's right? what you're aiming for. That's what you're aiming for. We want you to listen to it. If you feel uncomfortable, we want you to listen to it because yeah. that's who it's for. Yeah. Well, I'll leave you with this. What's the future of the space program? Are do you have performances coming up? Unfinished Media? business. <laughs> yeah. That's how I like that's, to look at some good. EPMD type stuff. Like I feel like it's unfinished business. Yeah, I think we're we're in a we're in a transitional phase right now. I mean, I'm moving to Tulsa and I just need to get Everything situated there, but there have been conversations. We're, we're hoping to essentially build a record label idea out of this this project, and as well as some some services that people are a part of. So we have Think Progress here, who's finishing up his master's program in counseling. That's to create the capital to to control our own narrative, but also provide funding to these individuals who are doing the work that is going to help eradicate generational traumas that we face each mm-hmm. and every day. So it's more than just the music. It's how can we use the music to reach the people, but also how can we introduce them to these services that we're providing as well. So from financial literacy standpoint, from arts and action that Omari has with getting more black and brown kids in, interested in the arts. Um, these are all different services that we know are our needs in our communities. And we just know that the space program is just a stepping stone for us to to provide them with the the resources that they actually need. I think it's, I like to say unfinished business because I think we came together for his dissertation, right? He brought us together for the the purpose of doing something great and fantastic. I think 
very early on. And I think even me and uh, Jacoby, who started a couple years ago, you start to know, like, damn, this is more than <laughs> just like helping a, helping a friend out with a, with a project. It's, I it's, think you opened the Pandora's box. Yeah, I think it's, don't, it's, don't it's, stop. It's, it's more stop. valuable. But I think mm-hmm. throughout the process, we got stuck on anti freedom and blackness. But I think we, most of us, would say at the end. We have limitations to the work to where we didn't talk about things that mm-hmm. we sh- we need to talk about. Yeah. So there's two phases for me. Like this first is the musical phase of it for me where I feel like we're all individuals. Like we all come from different things. He brought us on because we're all like we have our own talent, our own perspective, this own thing. When you bring us together like that and we have our own agenda, it's hard to keep us together. So it's tough. But I think I would like to see what it sounds like to do another album. Because now we got that experience. Mm-hmm. And I think I've grown as a poet. I think I've grown perspectively. I think I've grown as a person. I would love to see what an album musically would sound like just from us, from the one experience. Because I think we had to get a feel for each other. But the second part of that is we have more to say. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. we left a lot out. Mm-hmm. I think if you go back and listen to this podcast, there's a lot more that just from four of many members, mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. have more to say. And I think it's more that's needed. And I hope that somehow... We get an opportunity to go forward because I think it's going to benefit. I think we need to get more ears on it. We need to get more perspective and we need to get more. I think we've learned to. And I think we need to get out there and get more more product out there to the streets, but not for notoriety, as Jacoby said, yeah. because it's just it's needed. And this is the your growth. Just, just talking about your growth. Yeah. I remember when we started, <laughs> like you, you didn't even want to say, like you didn't even want to spit your shit in the studio. No, no. I got on Instagram two weeks ago. This man got... 15 poems yeah. all on his Instagram yeah. feed. And it's like, it's that's awesome. It's just dope to see that growth where it's like, it's Keep not, it. nobody told him to do it. Mm-hmm. Nobody told him this is how you do it. It's just internally, he worked through, he did the inner work to manifest this out of himself. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it came from just looking within. That's you you start finding your voice and that's yeah. what it is. You realize there's more to be done and more yeah. work to be done. And I want to do more of it. And I want to, I think there's, I want to inspire others to do the same too. Like you said, I think, the record label, you know, slash nonprofit that we want to do is, I think it's different than what you see because we're not doing it for notoriety. We're just trying to manifest something bigger than what we are. But I think we have to stick together and do it. So I think for me on a personal level, like what I see for us, I think I see just more. I see more of this. I think we just scratched the surface. I think we barely scratched the surface. Yeah. I think this was for his dissertation. What happens when it's for something bigger? Because dissertation was, it was great and it was for his PhD, but what happens when it's for something much bigger? How, how broad can we think? Yeah. And so I'm inspired for, by that just opportunity to do more. Well, I'll definitely keep an eye out on things and performances. And gentlemen, I appreciate you taking the time. This has been incredible. It's been eye opening and, and I hope to get this word out. And I think the key is, and I'd never thought about this, is sometimes you have to make people uncomfortable. Yes, sir. You're thinking of these things and you're talking about issues that for a lot of people have never been comfortable. And so through the things that you put out, it's a great message and it doesn't always make people smile and happy and all that, but it makes you think. Yes, and sir. so that's it. So. Yeah, well, we just wanted to leave off with, I mean, if people want to listen to the album, it's a tspalbum.com and it's $16.19 commemoration of 400 years of slavery so it's year 2019 and so yeah email list list. oh yeah so they can go on the website they can sign up on our email list so any things that we come out with do have things planned we do have things planned great so yeah they can definitely check out the website i appreciate these truly gifted artists taking the time to visit with me today and i hope our conversation has been enlightening you can find out more about the space program and the curriculum of the mind at tspalbum.com Their music and artistry presents an engaging discourse that is both needed and healthy in order to challenge people's viewpoints in an effort to make us all become human together.